the gentleman next to you had a question, sir. Please review your fiery speech regarding freedom before the revolution. Oh, the, uh, you're speaking of perhaps the one in Richmond town? Yes, sir. I, I believe I understand you. For I, I flatter myself that every time I open my mouth, I offer something worth remembering, <laughs> uh, especially when it has to do with freedom. Uh, but I believe the gentleman might be referring to uh, something actually I said last year. Uh, the circumstances, I believe it would be proper for me to, uh, to recount for you as brief as I may. War had not yet happened, although our friends, our brethren in Boston were suffering miserably already as a result of the intolerable acts. Their, uh, the Navy, the British Navy was blockading their port. Uh, all of their civil rights and liberties were stripped away. Military government imposed, quartering of British troops. Horrendous. And I was one of few people in America who believed that inevitably Great Britain was going to try to do that to everyone. Not just those who destroyed tea, but to everyone. I also realized that through the past 10 years, they have been sending even greater numbers of British regulars, Marines, and naval ships to our shores. What could they be coming for? To protect us? <laughs> Hardly. Their aim, their aim, I was certain, and again I was in a great minority, was to force us to submit to them. In effect, to affix shackles of slavery upon our wrists. And I also observed to those gentlemen that we're not prepared to defend ourselves against such a powerful force. So, at the second convention, which met in Richmond Town at the town church, not here in Williamsburg, because we wanted to put some distance between Lord Dunmore and ourselves, I introduced a resolution calling for Virginia to place herself into a posture of defense by forming independent companies of foot. Gentlemen volunteers, age 16 to 60, in every county throughout the whole of Virginia, so that when that invasion did come, we'd be able to repel it. They were, of course, those cool conservative men who spoke out against my resolution. Their argument in effect being, please, Mr. Henry, we want peace, sir, not war. And your scheme is not the way to go about a peaceful solution. Why, if we form up these independent companies you're proposing, the British government is going to view that as a hostile or aggressive action. And rather than keeping this invasion you're predicting at bay, we'll be inviting them here. We'll be inviting them to do the same things that they did to the people in Boston. Peace, Mr. Henry, peace. And furthermore, sir, have you lost your senses? We are far too weak to give any consideration to contesting the might of the great British lion. As I looked around the town church, I became increasingly alarmed that these men had successfully persuaded a majority of men to vote against my resolution, thus continuing us in this defenseless state. It is then that I desired to be recognized, knowing I had to do something, and I uh, took to the floor and delivered forth a great many more words than future generations might realize. For if you've not yet discovered it, I am not one for brevity. <laughs> uh, but which did conclude with one particular statement for which I expect I might be best remembered. And a pity, too. Uh, not that I would for a moment wish to uh, lessen or, or uh, uh, denigrate the significance, the importance of that day. It was, after all, the first public cry for independence heard in America, the first call to arms. At the same time, my contributions to the cause of liberty and the birth of this nation are manyfold, and to be remembered by most Americans well into the future for but part of a sentence only. <laughs> Speak of injustice. Uh, I'll say, too, that I do not write my uh, prepared statements in advance, as many gentlemen do, and simply read my words from the floor once recognized, uh, or as others will do, give their prepared statements to someone of better voice to have the other gentleman read his remarks. I have certainly upon occasion referred to notes uh, that I might keep my train of thought, but uh, most times, as that time, speaking extempore for my mother wit. And uh, happily, my uh, orate, uh, oratory and my ability at delivering said oration will persuade a slight majority of men to favor my resolution. Five votes will separate the House. That is how divided a country we are right now. Uh, my resolution will carry. Independent companies will begin to form all over Virginia and as I predicted, we'll be ready for less than a month later. Dunmore will steal the powder from the public magazine. Blood will be spilled at Lexington Green. We'll be at the ready. 
Uh, in fact, inspired by my words, which will spread like a wildfire throughout the rest of these American colonies, soldiers will begin to form to the far north as Rhode Island, where they too, like most Virginia fighting soldiers, will be sewing or stitching liberty or death upon the breast of their hunting shirts, adopting it as their battle cry. There will be something in three different of our states, to include Virginia, South Carolina, and Connecticut, which will be known popularly as the Patrick Henry Standard, a battle flag. In some cases, a white field with a black border around it. In other cases, a golden yellow in hue, with a coiled rattlesnake upon the middle of it. Liberty emblazoned above, or death below. In some cases, as with the Culpeper Rifle Company, liberty or death above, don't tread on me, below. And that flag will be carried upon a number of battlefields in the ensuing months and years to come. And finally, to conclude, for I'm a signal, it's time for me to take my leave from these premises and return to the business of state. But it occurs to me, as I hope I have made plain already, that we have established a bold experiment here in this city of Williamsburg, the birthplace of American liberty, and uh, it will serve, I am confident, not only as a beacon of hope for oppressed societies all around this globe, but I expect, too, it will serve as the envy of some others. I warrant you, there will always be those wicked forces, both from without of our shores as well as from within. Within our own government, perhaps, at times, Men who are going to seek to change our uniquely American way of life, which we hold so dear and so precious, to impose their will upon us and to deprive us of that precious jewel of liberty. When such times of crisis do emerge into the future, and they will, I pray that once again those words might stand as the battle cry. Liberty or death. For Americans, there is no other option. Gentlemen and ladies, I must return to the business of state. If you were at all able, I would urge you to remain here at this place, for I have invited uh, a number of uh, friends, political allies of mine, who uh, worked with me in close concert in the previous convention. Uh, they, uh, they hope to be able to engage uh, you in a, uh, in a discussion, a conversation, about the responsibilities that do come with being citizens uh, in, a, uh, in a new nation and no longer subjects to a distant king. I pray that if you were able to, that you will remain. Uh, in the meantime, I thank you for your kind uh, attention. God save you, the rights and liberties of America, and the fighting men of the